best coaches in the game. <laughs> we really ain't playing. We regroup up in the Slack chat where the coaches debrief. We be piecing these puzzles, occupy the chunk of the pie. Ain't no lie when we hit the block. Helmets, casket is got. You be seeing helmet after helmet, helmet after helmet. First place, second place, fifth place, eighth place, twelfth place, fifteen, sixteen, twenty. So many helmets, you got blur vision. We got. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another bowl call fantasy football podcast. Today's topic, fantasy bus. Players, you should avoid drafting if you don't want your season-long fantasy team to go down the drain. My name is Kevin Allen. I'm your host as always. And joining me once again, Season Long Says, a.k.a. Alan Sislowski. That's right. Your nickname is now your full name. What's up, Says? Yeah, that was a, a pretty polished opening you did there. It sounded almost like you'd practice that. Usually you're a little more off the cuff. I'm working on it, man. We're trying to get this thing on the radio. And yeah. um should be no I'm problem. Told I gotta right? be a little more professional with my uh with my openings. So no, that's see that doesn't work for you. Authent uh, uh sincerity and authentic authenticity is what works for you, geek. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna start talking like, hey everybody, welcome back to the bold calls fantasy football podcast. All right. Now we, we are yeah. sincere. <laughs> we're today we're gonna break down <clears throat> us. This is one of the most important topics in your draft because a lot of us are slaves to ADP, right? You see that player sitting there. He's next available. I've got a few. Actually, even as we're sitting here, I'm thinking of, I got another one on my list. But we sit there and we watch the ADP and we're like, oh, I need to take him because he's the best available player. We're going to avoid the crowd thought process and make bold calls here. Hmm. So stay tuned. But before we get into that, says, remember, I have to do the business of the show, which is like and subscribe to the channel. You got to like the video. It helps us with our algorithms on YouTube to get seen. Subscribe to the channel so that you know when we're going live with one of these. You can jump in. You can ask questions. It's a beautiful thing. So we're going to help you win your season-long leagues. We break down all the position groups. The bowl call podcast covers everything. But today we're covering Fantasy Bus. So it says, how do you feel about this in general uh, in terms of Drafting against ADP, trusting wisdom of the crowd, or sort of shutting down a player completely that you say, hey, this guy, I don't like him. Do you take them off your draft board? How do you approach it? Yeah, I never take them off my draft board unless there's like a legitimate reason to. And you bring up a really good point because, you know, it's it's pretty easy. Uh, it, it's 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 a tricky thing when you talk about bus because you could just name whoever you want and you're probably going to be right because most players fail as fantasy football players right and we're not going to pick anyone in the first two rounds or the first round because those are all good players so a real trick the real the real thing would be like hey which one of the first round players is going to bust and we know one of them are so really what we mean is what we think the value of the player is versus where they're getting drafted and that's what a bust is now i've already conceded that I'm probably going to be wrong on um, a few of my players. So the guys that I don't like, not even that I think are bust, but say, for example, I don't like a player like Tyler Boyd, just using him as an example. I'll still draft a few shares of him in best ball leagues because chances are I'm going to be wrong about a few guys, and I want to get those players just in case I'm wrong. But back to the topic at hand, bust players are players that we've earmarked, that we really have gotten together on, and we think that there's – pretty much, um, you know, a, a, an 80% chance or better that they're not going to return value. That's how we're defining return it. value. That's the key. That's the key component here. If I take a player, so to, to describe what defines a bust, if I take a player as RB seven and they return RB 22 value, that was a bust, right? That was a bad pick because, Hey, I took him seventh RB overall and you know, he wasn't terrible, but it wasn't what I was looking for out of that player. Um, similarly on the wide receiver spot, which is much more, um, dramatic in terms of the ability to pick bus. If I take a, a wide receiver 14 and they return wide receiver 42 number, that was a bus. So let's jump right into it. Sislowski, what is your first bust call for the 2020 NFL draft or fantasy NFL draft? Yeah. I mean, l let me just preface this with that this has been a you know i, I don't want it's it's almost cliche at this point to say that 2020 has been like no other year that the um, the precautions that the nfl teams are having to take because of the global pandemic um it just it, it makes for a, a lot of different handicapping Wait, can, can i do a side note yeah 
Uh, I had a long discussion with uh, some people, and I feel like the only people who call it a, a pandemic are Karens. Okay, so what are we calling it? Uh, the, the Rona. Because of the Rona. Okay, I, all right. Yeah, I, I felt like that. Global I, pandemic. That's a, that just sounds like a, 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 you know, a housewife who's to, complaining about sending the kids back to school. She's like, <clears throat> I just want to send them back during a global pandemic. Fair enough. Fair enough. So the, because of Corona, because of because of, of, of precautions that the teams are taking, that they've had less practice time, they've had uh, less, you know, interactions with their teams, with their coaches. So I think rookies are at a big disadvantage more so than any other year. They're already at it. But that leads me to Clyde Edwards Hilaire, who's going in the top 25 picks this year. Now, that aside, just take aside that the whole, uh, that, you know, that they're not going to be able to get up to speed at the same rate that they might have. Now, I know he was taken in the first round of the real NFL draft. I know that the coaches thought that he looks like he could have the upside of Brian Westbrook and he catches and he's a prolific pass catcher. That said, Damian Williams is still on the team, right? Damian Williams, by by many people's observations, was the real Super Bowl MVP. He had a great postseason. Now, we know Damian Williams has, has never been a high-usage guy and that he's had some uh, trouble staying healthy, but he's still going to be a very healthy part of the offense, and especially in the first four weeks of the season. If you're drafting Clyde edwards helaire in round two, there's a chance that you're going to get almost, you know very minimal production. Now, if you know that, the upside is certainly there, but I have stayed away. I'm not taking Clyde edwards helaire in any redraft leagues in the second round because I just don't see anything more than a 50% share at best. And it's probably a lot lower than that in the first three, four weeks. And in a 13 week fantasy season, a third of the season, you cannot have a guy that your second round pick, like we always say, geek, it's hard to win your draft in the first two rounds, but you certainly can lose it. And Clyde Edwards Hilaire, the floor is too low. And I'm picking him as a bust at his current cost in uh, for my first pick. I love that call. And, um, I, I totally agree. Uh, I think people are definitely discounting the fact that Damian Williams is still there. And the best case scenario for Elaire is going to be some sort of a timeshare. Again, great team to be on. Lots of scoring opportunities to go around. But a little bit a little bit tough when you're talking about RB11, which is where he's going. Yeah, ahead and of full blast starters. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like, if he was available in the fourth round, no problem. It's worth the risk. But people are taking him ahead of Nick Chubb. They're taking him ahead, even of Aaron Jones, who you and I, you know, we'll, we'll talk about him in a little bit. The guy is guaranteed to play. You know, I mean, there's no guarantee that Clyde Edwards Hilaire even gets on the field more than a handful of snaps in the first three, four weeks. And again, for Dynasty, no problem. You take him first overall, it's a great situation. But in redraft leagues, your second round pick, you, you could do better. There we go. I like that call. Um, I'm right, going to the wide receiver position because I'm just like a little back and forth. I do have a running back, but but I'm going to switch to the wide receiver position to give you my first bust of the season, and that's Denver wide receiver Cortland Sutton. And before before I get panned on this, let me hear me out. Last season, the Broncos had nothing going on at wide receiver outside of Cortland Sutton. Nothing. He got 125 targets last year. So he went from an 84 target guy in his rookie year. He went up to 125. And the general consensus isn't looking for another uh, 1,000 yard, six reception, uh, six touchdown season, which was which was perfectly fine last year. But people are drafting him number uh, at wide receiver 22 overall with the expectation that those reception numbers, all of those numbers will go up a little bit. And I beg to differ. Number one, they've added Jerry Judy on that team. They've added a bunch of weapons, a, a pass catching running back. The Denver team that was forced to throw to him every single throw because they had nothing else going on at wide receiver last year is just not what we're going to see this year. We're also dealing with a rookie quarterback that has not had a good game well, uh, or, or a, a second, second, year, quarterback. Year, a second yeah. year quarterback, but that has no history of, of being able to throw for 300 yards in a game. There's too many hands to mouths to feed. There's a second rookie wide receiver on that team. Sure, it's going to take them a minute to get up to speed, but the quarterback, not that good. I think people are going to be disappointed with Cortland Sutton. I think he's going way too high um, in the draft. I could tell you names like Terry McLaurin, Stefan Diggs, Devontae Parker, Marquise Brown, A.J. Green, uh, Tyler Boyd, Wilfa, all these names that are going after him that I would take ahead of um, 
ahead of him. I'm going to tell you right now, Cortland Sutton will not end up on any of my fantasy teams this year. Let somebody else uh, put him on their uh, team and stink up their WR2 position. Right. What say got, you, Season Long says? I, I see your point. I absolutely see your point. Like it's 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 very well founded. You laid out the case. It's it's um it, it's a good it's a good take. That said, let me ask you a question. So we just talked about a minute ago that this is a uh, a year where guys on new teams, guys that don't have chemistry, um, new situations, new offenses are going to probably lag behind and take a time to catch up. Do you give any? credence to the fact that Cortland Sutton and Drew Locke did play together for six weeks. They did have success in those six weeks connecting. Does that at least push back the other way for you and say, there's something to that, uh, a wide receiver and a quarterback that have chemistry that have continuity. Yeah, no, I think that that part is really good. So I, I'm total agreement that these rookies are going to take a minute to get situated with these teams. It's going to be really tough to trust any of them to produce. But I just don't think that even last year, what I saw out of Cortland Sutton was enough. Do you going to take Cortland Sutton over DJ shark? Because that's where he's going. And yeah. I think it's ridiculous um, over Terry McLaurin and Tyler Lockett and Stefan Diggs. This is yeah. my issue. It's not so much that I hate Cortland Sutton as a player. I actually think he's a fine wide receiver three, almost a low end wide receiver three. Like, you know, if I'm making a decision between T Y Hilton or AJ green or, or, you know, one of those type of guys, maybe. All right, so know, where does he where does he belong? This, he, I'm going to give you an either or. Would you take Tyler Boyd or would you take uh, Cortland Sutton? I mean that's the that's the that's an important decision point, and I'd probably take Tyler Boyd there. Okay, how about someone like Will Fuller with the tremendous upside or Cortland Sutton? Yeah, I, I might take. See, that's that's that area, right? All right, I'll so take you have Cortland him. Sutton over Jarvis Landry, who's going in that spot because right. Landry is hurt, and so I don't more, believe in him. But, so more but or less, in your rankings, you'll have him in the top 36, near the bottom, near 36, as a wide receiver three. If he was going in the late sixth round, early seventh round, that's where you're considering him. Yeah, I, I'm never getting him because he he goes. You might. If he starts to drop, I might. But you know, as of now, where he goes now, ahead of Tyler Lockett, ahead of Terry McLaurin, ahead of Devontae Parker, I'm not pulling the trigger on Cortland Sutton over Devontae Parker. Parker was a fucking beast last year. Okay, when when he finally woke up and started playing, he was a beast. They they have good quarterbacks in Miami. Uh, Marquise Brown healthy this year. These are all guys going after Cortland Sutton. So for me, my issue with Cortland Sutton is I just don't think he's that stud that people think. Like you're taking him at 22 because you're expecting him to rise up into the top 15. I don't see it happening. Fair enough. I like that call, man. I like it. There we go. All right, I'll throw it back over to you. Give me another player that you're not drafting at their current ADP. You think they will bust or return below ADP value? Yeah, so I just went really young on the last one. I did a rookie. I'm going to go the opposite end. I'm going to go with one of the oldest players in the NFL. And I it, it blows my mind every time someone drafts Drew Brees, even in one QB leagues. Uh, in Superflex, I mean, you know, you could do better. But he, here what I'm, here's what I'm talking about. Drew Brees is 41 years old. Now, I know that there's, we talked about continuity being important. That team is basically back as was. I mean, I get it. But... Drew Brees offers zero rushing upside. He doesn't even give you those sneaks on the goal line like he once did. They, you know, now they'll give it to Taste Tom Hill. Drew Brees, that's another thing. Sometimes Drew Brees will even come out when the ball's on the three yard line and he won't even give you that little pop pass to the tight end. Drew Brees, he missed a few games. So uh, last year, it's, uh, he doesn't have this. He, he's still a great NFL quarterback, but. For fantasy, he's going as like the QB ten. Let me look. We, I pulled it up. He's going as the QB nine. He's inside of the top ten. Carson Wentz, Aaron Rodgers, Daniel Jones, Matthew Stafford, all going after him. Um, it just it, it is it is crazy to me that I mean this is the classic. You're drafting him on uh, on brand name name um, only. In order for him to return top 10 value. That means Drew Brees it doesn't mean like he, this is his ceiling. You need him to throw for 5,000 yards and have about 33 touchdowns. Okay. Now is that in the range of outcomes for Drew Brees? Absolutely. But that would be like a great season in order for, again, for someone like Daniel Jones, he probably only needs to, to hit the top 10, probably about 3,800 yards, but he'll give you 400 yards rushing and he'll probably score two or three times. And then he's in the top 10 point is with no rushing upside, 
with advanced age, there is no way in one quarterback leagues you should even think about Drew Brees as a top 10 quarterback. You're better off waiting uh, for uh, for the next tier, two tiers down, Jared Goff, Baker Mayfield, and then some of the other guys we talked about. Um, uh, are you totally with me agree. on this one? Okay. Totally agree because Taysom Hill is going to steal – five of those touchdowns over the course of the season as well. So uh, Drew Brees really needs to actually do more than your They become more of a running team also. Like the Saints, I remember four years ago, I mean, Drew Brees was was snapping off 5,000-yard seasons with 40 touchdowns, no problem. But they are, you know, they are basically a running team at this point. Yeah, they want to focus on the run. And again, the, um, between Kamara and Taysom Hill, who will run for touchdowns by the goal line, and, and even Lats Murray, it, it hasn't been a good scene for Breeze, and he's terrible on the road as well. So there's six games or, you know, there's those eight games where he's on the road and, you know, he never really produces as well on the road. You know, there's a big, big splits um, situation going on with him. I mean, I'm not going to go to the quarterback position because it's just a, a position group that I well, think has I, quite I, a lot of these. I know, and I understand, but when I see such like I have Drew Brees at like QB 16 and he's going as QB nine, that's it's why egregious. it it's stood out. Yeah, I mean Daniel Jones at fourteen is ridiculous. Baker right, it's crazy. I mean, yeah, could, so let me ADP of quarterback is just insane this year. Insane. So yeah. let me ask you this though: in a dynasty league, and I mean it, see, it's going to seem obvious to you, but I, I don't want just give me your rationale here. Would you rather have Sam Darnold, who's going as in in redraft one QB leagues as QB twenty two, or Drew Brees, a dynasty league? Sam Darnold all day, of course. I mean, right? Long. It seems so obvious, yeah. but. Uh, it, it, I don't know. Okay. He's All not right, well liked. He's not well liked. Jets, Adam Gase, yeah. but long term, he's going to be fine. All right. Let me jump back over to the wide receiver position for my next one. And this is a guy I just, you know, you ever have these guys? I never draft this guy. And I'm always shocked. He's always like ADP. I don't know who's taking him, why he's always this high. This is someone actually who's going ahead of Cortland Sutton. So, but in that same. WR2, this is a high end, I guess they'll call it low end WR2 range. This is WR20 according to current ADP data, and that is Keenan Allen. Uh, Chargers, wide receiver. And here's my here's my issue with Keenan Allen. Keenan Allen has always been, for his entire career, a volume-based PPR wide receiver. He's not a touchdown scorer. He hasn't been a, a yardage guy. As a matter of fact, last season, he had 149 targets on that team. Season before, 136. So this is a guy who gets his druthers. Now, he only got 1,199 yards. He basically has replicated about 1,200 yards each of the past two seasons on massive volume. So what that tells you is, I'm trying to see the touchdown numbers. It's not a lot, though. Um, yeah, no, I mean he's a, he's a catch. A year. He's a catches and yards player. He's, he's a catches. He's just a catches guy. Now, what's going on with the the Chargers? They switched quarterback. They've got a low volume disaster in Tyrod Taylor um, at the helm. Behind him is a rookie. None of these bode well for a volume wide receiver. To top that off, they've they've got. Mike Williams, who still needs to be fed. They've got Hunter Henry, who needs to be fed. There's so many more weapons on this team. Austin Eckler's a pass catching back. This is a recipe for disaster for Keenan Allen supporters. I'm sorry, guys. Don't draft Keenan Allen. You are so, going to be disappointed. And to take him, I'm sorry, but let me take it a step further. To take him at WR20 ahead of DJ Shark. Ahead of Tyler Lockett. Again, the same group. Terry McLaurin, Devontae Parker, Marquise Brown. Are you fucking crazy? Tyler Boyd. The, um, Marvin Jones Jr. should be taken ahead of him. This is a terrible pick for whoever's making it. And he will drop. And I bet, and I'm willing, you can caption this, that by the time the draft rolls around for your actual draft, if you're not drafted today, July 9th, uh, 9th that that ADP will drop even further than 20. You've probably seen him available See, still at WR30. He, I, you know, it's funny you say that. I, I was thinking, the, uh, and I agree with you on the call, by the way. It's spot on. It, I'm upset with myself that I didn't use him as one of my busts because he seems like one of the most obvious. But yeah, I think his ADP actually is going to rise. I think he's one of those name brand players. Such a mistake. That's I, I hope it does. And I'll be hoping that somebody in my league, I, I watch him and he's the top guy. I'm like, take fucking Allen, take fucking Allen. Because oh, yeah. one always... extra guy that gives a chance to drop to me 
I don't care. I'm telling you, I'm not touching Allen for the first 36 picks, Keenan Allen. Volume yeah, I mean, machine with Tyrod Taylor? What do you know? Yeah, nuts? dude, he, he's going later than that. He's not he's going in like round four or five. Well, uh Allen? Yeah, he might be. I have it? him pick no, I have him WR20 overall. I'm only looking at the position group. Okay, but you said in the top 36 picks. I'm not uh, no, saying- I meant in the top 36 36- picks. Wide, wide receiver receivers. picks. Right, right, right. right. Okay. I, I'm, I just speak because there's so many different. Understand. All right. The terminal. The reason I look at ADP against the position group is because every league is different. You look at ADP data. Yeah. And, he's going at 50 overall. So that's just yeah. that. He's going right on the four or five turn in 12 team leagues. But WR20, and that's what's important. Yeah. People are taking him above DJ Shark, above Lockett, above Terry McLaurin. Are you fucking crazy? Who is doing this? All right. I get that you saw his logs from last year and the year before, but that was with Philip Rivers. This is Tyrod Taylor or Justin, like Eber, a rookie. They're not going to be able to deliver the football to a possession wide receiver the same way that Philip Rivers did. They had the connection. Are you fucking nuts? Don't draft this guy under any circumstance. I, I don't care where he is. He's going to sit there and he's going to ruin your team. You're Which think he got a name. Which uh, which L.A. Charger pass catcher? We which L.A. Charger you think will have the most receptions in 2020? To say the most receptions is, I, I think it's going to be Austin Eckler. There you go. Uh, okay, you know, any chance to give Austin Eckler love on this show? You, you know, I'm going to do it. Let me tell you another thing. If we're talking about the Chargers wide receivers, Mike Williams gets a bum rap. This guy is a talent. They were. I think he will emerge as the number one guy, and I think we'll see that this year. Uh, something about his relationship with with Philip Rivers. I don't know the fuck was going on there, but like when I didn't see Mike Williams be bad, I never saw it. I saw him going up and getting the football, being athletic, being one of these giants, being just like um, the AJ Browns and the 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 next level giant wide receivers. The, uh, did I say AJ Brown? The uh, yeah, the AJ Browns. The uh, who are the big who are the big dudes that we love? Cortland Sutton a little bit. Uh, speaking of just giant wide yeah, receivers. Yeah, you're talking about like Calvin Johnson, Andre Johnson, like those type yeah, of guys. Kenny Gall- the, the, these, the go these, up and get it. These you know? big athletic guys, right? Mike Williams is that perfect. There's nothing I've seen out of him that tells me he's not going to be an excellent player. He's going WR47. And if you need to take a Chargers wide receiver, take Mike Williams. And oh, by the way, go get Mike Williams in your fucking dynasty team too. He's available for cheap. Yeah, I mean, a salute, man. I, I thought, you know, it's uh, that's all good takes, all good takes. Yeah, and it's funny, just speak, uh, you know, any chance I get to talk about Austin Eckler, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I know. And you will and, be there. You know, yeah, Austin I just, Eckler, did you see on Twitter somebody was ripping on him for like a worse team? And he's like, uh, for his volume, he's like, do you realize I also play? Like, I have designed, like, he literally said shit that I've been saying on the bold calls for the last six months. He is like, 30% of my, of my snaps are lined up as a wide receiver. Like you're not accepting the fact that yes, I'm a lower volume running back than maybe somebody else, but I'm getting, I line up split as a split wide receiver and I have designed route runs, not like a regular running back that just gets a check down. And that's the difference with Austin Eckler and everybody. We talked about, but we talked about this on, on this bold calls like months ago, he came out on Twitter and actually pointed that out to someone who's critiquing people for drafting Eckler too high. So yeah. Austin Eckler himself came out and said it, which is pretty cool. Should have had that graphic for us. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Can't. I mean, I, I, when you re-edit, you pop the graphic up of his uh, of his tweet where he's like, you know, there is a tweet out there about it. Yeah, and and you know, like I said, he's a first round player for us. If you go to the dfsarmy.com website, the draft kit that is live right now. If you want to take a look at it, just click on the NFL tab, and then under season long, it, there's the draft kit. We have rankings up there. We have our our sleeper picks, some value picks. We're going to be constantly putting more information up there it's uh, a really robust dro- uh, draft kit that we're doing this year I have a lot of contributors like flex shane like you geek myself and uh, a couple of our, our our back office guys are thinking about contributing to it as well so um definitely check that out but if you look in the running back rankings i have austin eckler as a first round pick now i have not needed to take him there yet I've been in some high stakes draft. We reviewed my beat Chris list draft on this podcast a couple weeks ago. I got him in the second round. I would happily take him in the first round of, of fantasy draft. So we are big on Austin Eckler over here. And uh, we don't think that that ma- matters who the QB is. It really doesn't to me. All right. All right. Hit me, hit me with your next one says, what is your next fantasy bust 
2020 NFL season. So this may seem like a cheap call to you because it, it could be obvious with some of the latest kind of news cycle that's out there. But I, I had this guy targeted for a bust no matter what anyway. And I'm going to go with Raheem Mostert of San Francisco 49ers who's going in the fourth round, fifth round in some drafts. Now, I know the news, I'm going to go air quotes here, news came out that he's requesting a trade. And I made a joke on Twitter that said, uh, Raheem Mostert goes to the GM, says, I'm requesting a trade. Uh, the GM goes, request denied, play on. I mean, <laughs> what leverage does Raheem Mostert have? Now, I understand why he wants a trade. Who's trading wants- for Raheem Mostert? There you go. There, There's the answer. Now, Raheem Mostert was good. He, he was excellent. He's always been an excellent player, but he's 28 years old, right? He's been a, a lifelong special teams player. And in that system, I'm a big believer that the Shanahan system produces the running backs, not the other way around. Now, I know Raheem Mostert's fast. I know Raheem Mostert's pretty good, but he doesn't catch passes. This is why I, I didn't see him as a, as, a, as a fourth round running back. He's probably earmarked for 12 carries a game. They have three or four running backs there. I know they traded Matt Breda, but they still have Jarek McKinnon, who restructured to stay there, who's by all accounts, going to be involved in the passing downs. You have Tevin Coleman there, who's going five or six rounds later, who who looks like, you know, he he's Tevin Coleman. He's a pretty good running back. Um, Raheem Mostert felt for me felt more like when I was in the in back in February, I was like, where's Raheem Mostert gonna go? I thought maybe he would go like late sixth, early seventh. Even but that's before I knew about all this running back inflation, but I'm sure his ADP is gonna drop a little bit now because the news cycle with him wanting to be traded, but I just think in the fourth round, you're setting your in PPR leagues, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. There's so many good wide receivers over there, and there's certainly better running backs around later. Damian Williams, who we talked about a few minutes ago on the podcast, is just a straight up better pick. Raheem Mostert's going to be like a frustrating wide receiver. You're never going to know when to start him. When you when you sit him, he's going to go off. When you put him in, he's going to have a bad game. Um, Coleman I'm not, yeah. could easily, assuming nothing changes on that team. Coleman could easily just outproduce Raheem Mostert. Easily. And then you have Jarek McKinnon, who's, like I said, is going to be significant in, in certain weeks in fantasy. Like, if he's healthy and you can get him with the last... We're going to do another podcast, by the way, called The Best Last Round Picks. And Jarek McKinnon is going to be number one on my list as one of the best, one of the best 16th round picks you can make. Just some names going after Raheem Mostert in your draft that I, I probably like all of these guys more. Mark Ingram. Oh, I mean, David, David Montgomery. Oh, uh, DeAndre Swift, Damian Williams. Yeah. Darius Geis, way after. Way after. That was good how you did that. I did the, voice, yeah. I did the radio uh, voice. If, if I'm looking at Raheem Mostert, the guys that I would take Raheem Mostert ahead of, like solidly, is Keyshawn Vaughn. I'd take him ahead of him there. I mean, that's a 50 50, but Tariq Cohen. And then I would take him ahead of like the high upside backups. That's where I would put Raheem Mostert. Up. Like, so I would take yeah, Mostert I mean, ahead of like Madison, uh, you know, Philip Lindsay, uh, those type of players. I would take him ahead of those guys. But before uh, those other running backs that have locked in three down roles and, and probably some pass catching ability. I would even take Jordan Howard ahead of him because we know Jordan Howard's going to be the goal line back. This is a recency bias situation. Raheem Mostert is on a good team that runs a lot. There's going to be, I don't know if I'm going the Jordan Howard route here. There's going to be opportunities for him. He'll, he'll be fine. But again, no pass catching. He's on a running team. No pass catching. And he's splitting the non pass, the, the, the up the gut runs with Coleman. So, he is part of really what is a three-way split situation. Yeah, and uh, you know before his injury, uh, Debo Samuel was going to be earmarked to get a few carries. We saw it in the Super Bowl where they do some reverses. So on a given drive, if there's six or seven runs, there may only be like four runs available. Because and by the way, Brandon Ayuk. Uh, the rookie that they drafted in the first round out of Arizona State, he does the same things that Debo does. He does those end-around runs. He takes those short passes. So I, I think that you could say San Francisco is a running team, and they are, but they're also more of a short-passing slash running team. So I, I just think that as a whole, the running game is is going to be a r- good running game, but it's going to be very difficult to earmark which running back goes off when. In the fourth round, you cannot afford that risk. In the seventh, eighth round, where Tevin Coleman's going, where Raheem Mostert should be going, no problem. Uh, um, I like it. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a name here. I'm gonna go to the tight end position, Ooh. 
And I'm going to give you a name here. I don't know if it's going to be controversial. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't actually think it's going to be go. I'm just shocked to see how high this guy is going, really, is what is what is bothering me. Number eight overall, TE8, is Hayden Hurst, the new tight end for the Atlanta Falcons. Now, he is going ahead of Hunter Henry, um, Jared Cook, Mike Gusecki, Jonah Smith, a lot of guys that we like a lot. What the hell has Hayden Hurst done in his career to earn the eighth overall ADP at tight end outside of a really cool video where he was lifting weights and looking like a beast? What the fuck is going on? Who the hell is Hayden Hurst? He hasn't done shit. I get that he's on a team, Atlanta, that produces well to the tight end position. But to me, that's like a sleeper that I want to take, you know, as my TE2 and hope for the best. You want to take this guy and expect him to produce? What the fuck is going on here, says? Yeah, I mean, Hayden Hurst, you know, we've been doing best ball and, and mocks and dynasty startups since February, you and I, right? So I, I um, we've seen Hayden Hurst go from uh, tight end 27 when he before he was traded to about tight end 16 once he was traded. People weren't sure. And then we saw him become a top 12 tight end, and now he's a top eight tight end. What's I, I want to say. I mean, you know, listen, the people saw that Austin Hooper produced in that offense. They that Atlanta is probably has the highest projection for pass attempts this year. They'll probably throw at least 600 times. So I think that people think that that Hayden Hurst is going to step in and become and, and, and be Austin Hooper. Now, there's a chance of that. So I understand the side. You obviously like him a lot less. I know he doesn't have like a huge resume, but even in like the 30 past targets that he got last year he caught most of them so he you know it's a very small sample but he has proven to have pretty good hands um you know he didn't get a lot of opportunity in baltimore but they uh he was a first round pick about three years ago he's a little bit of an older prospect and he was traded for a second round pick so you know there's there's reason for optimism i'm with you that's a little high i don't have him as like some t2 i have him as a top 12 for sure but i understand I, I don't have a good you made a really good case why that he's going too high over some other players that we like better but uh, this is one where i do see the other side and i do have a few shares because if you know if, if uh, things pan you out might, you're gonna have your shares might have been when he was going to they were cheaper i'll T. admit that yeah i just think my issue with hearst isn't that i don't like his potential i do i do like his potential again for the reasons that you said not because he hasn't done anything. He didn't do anything with Baltimore. He never showed anything. But Baltimore liked Mark Andrews more. I, I, I'm a little bit more, though, on the why didn't he show anything? But like you said, he's on an Atlanta team that does produce to the tight end position. But shit, Austin Hooper's on the Browns. He's available like five picks later at, at tight end. Like, you know, and the Browns, Ninjoku asked for a trade. It's going to be the Austin Hooper show over there. Like, the same guy who was actually producing on that team is available way later. We have Mike Gusecki way later who tore up the fucking league in the second half of last season. Why is he all the way down at 13? No, it's just inexplicable to me that his ADP is this high. And again, part of what we're looking at here isn't who might be a breakout player because I would look at Hayden Hurst and say, yes, he could be a breakout player this year. He's absolutely the candidate for that. But do I want to pay TE8 prices for this guy when there are established players that are floating around that I can get much later in the draft. Yeah. That probably no. are going to out, outscore him or at least have more uh, a more solid potential to do that. All right. Well, you want to just go one more each? Yeah. Let's keep it going, man. Okay. I love yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you and I, um, well, you know, adhere to this very specific rule, this edict. And I'll, I'll admit, uh, you know, it's, it's always something that was, I didn't always practice. And then I heard, um, Scott Pianowski from Yahoo sports talk about this on Chris List's show. And, and he, he adopted it as, as he called it an edict, the injury edict and known as the Scott Pianowski doctrine almost. And I've adopted it now, uh, and I'll give him full credit, but there's so many injuries that happen in fantasy football that why run towards them? Why draft players that are already injured? Especially if you're not getting 
you know, the, the serious bargain bin discount. So that has been, um, an edict that you and I have practiced. Okay. That, and that, that kept, that kept our listeners off of such names as, um, last season, AJ green. Yep. And so um, this, so this season, why are people still after hearing the news of Debo Samuel still drafting him? Uh, at a, you know, he was going in the six. Now he's going in the eighth. Is that ninth. really happening? People are oh, still he, taking Debo. Yes, they're taking him in the eighth and ninth round, and you know, other op. When whenever there's a timetable given, and it's they say sometimes four to six months, people are like, oh, good, in four months we'll be back up to speed. I do the opposite, and again, this is influenced heavily by Scott's uh, by his edict. I you know, always go to the back end of the timetable, and then you have to add in a couple tune-up games. So by if you go with this timetable that was given to Debo, he's back about the third week of the season. Then you can't play him in the fourth week because you got to see, you know, you know his snaps are going to be limited. And let's say in that fourth week, he gets two catches for 28 yards. Are you really going to play him in week five? No. And then let's say he goes off in week five, so you put him in your lineup in week six, and then he has a down game because his foot flared up. And now you're just in this hell, okay, where you could have, when you could have taken Devontae Parker in that same range. Now, is there a chance he comes back? He's exactly who he was supposed to be, and he has a – fine. Let somebody else deal with that headache. Again, when you have five or six bench spots, these guys are roster cloggers. We've talked about this term. We need to do a full podcast on them. Roster cloggers. They're, you're going to have so many players that get hurt that maybe, God forbid, get the coronavirus – don't start your draft with these injured players. That is our advice. This Please year, do. more than ever, more than ever before, your bench spots are so critical, so critical, because you need to have Rona protection. You need your handcuffs for as many running backs as you have. You need a handcuff for each one. You need, more than ever, you need backups to potential injury. Across your lineup, again, an unusual year where we will absolutely see players out four or five weeks from an illness, something we've never seen before in the history of the NFL, where you have multi-week quote illness outside of fucking Sam Darnold getting the mono. I that got a question. The only time I ever saw it. I got a question for you because we're in a few leagues together and you know, I'm the commissioner in one of our, our big money leagues are, our, our you know, 300 plus dollar entry fee league. And what, how do you think Corona should be handled like with IR spots? Like, what do you think is fair to do? Should you add extra IR spots? Should those be Corona only? Um, I mean, it would be interesting to do a one season only. Yeah. One know, season three only. Corona, like only I, three. I, I don't normally do an IR in any league. Neither I, do never, I. I don't like it. Um, deeper benches, drop your players. But I, I think this is a season where you could put, you could tack on three IR spots for exclusively for Rona situations and, yeah. you know, it's you say it's unprecedented and this is what we're doing. Let you hold through, you know, keep those players while they get over their illness, hopefully. Without right. having to, you know, destroy your bench because you need more bench players when, when you're dealing with that, those situations. It's unprecedented. So, yes, I am down for um, and I, I think it's a wise decision to add. A, an IR, again, I don't like them. I, I don't normally use them in season-long leagues, but I think this year is a unique, special year. And maybe add another position or two to the bench as well, like in all leagues, maybe a a, a 16-player draft, maybe go to 18. You right. know, maybe a 14, go to 16, like whatever you're used to doing, maybe. And I say, I, I, I open it up because some leagues are five, uh, 10 players, five-man bench. Some leagues are 12 players. Some leagues have the flex, some that add a couple spots to the bench to your league, whatever type of league it is, just to account for that, to hold some more handcuffs and that type of thing. Absolutely. And I, and I, I got one more question that's, you know, coronavirus related as far as your leagues. Now, let you know, hopefully we get a full season of fantasy football, right? We get a full season. But how many games is enough to where if it the season gets abruptly pause or ends that you're awarding the prize money to oh my gosh so, don't even say such i believe that no, if, just, if you don't know and it's abrupt there is no prize the all see i was thinking return. i was thinking that it, it, again this is yeah we're just no because you have to run the playoffs you'd have to know no but see what i was thinking is that let's say that there's two months of nfl season and then it just that's it it's over so eight games i would say eight games is enough to at least just take the points order and that's how you distribute the money. Absolutely not. No. 
You can't do it. Had to have would have to be agreed upon. A number one, if that happens, it's a fucking disaster. The world is coming to an end, and we have other shit to worry about beyond well, our fantasy league. Yeah, but, but yeah, no, but what I'm saying is that they, you know, I was listening to a couple smart people that have some medical background, and they were saying that the the NFL has to be okay with at least 150 players testing positive for Corona. Like that is going to happen. 150 yeah, players. Yeah, there's now, no doubt. Most, I'm hearing mo I, most. I'm hearing this shit too. By the way, I'm hearing from people like. Oh yeah, they they think a lot of people think the season will be in jeopardy. Well, they, let's say them probably none of them will be. You know, they're they're young, they're healthy athletes will be hospitalized. But yeah, maybe some coaches will be hospitalized. You never know. I mean, there's a couple coaches out there that don't look like they're in fantastic physical health. But you, there's going to be players that get hospitalized. I mean, I mean, sorry, they, no, these they coaches, get coronavirus. You know, these I mean, coaches are in terrible physical condition. Not all, but some. You know, a lot of them because they're e they're they're working 18, 19 hours a day. They're eating junk food at, at you know at the office. Um, they're not in good shape. I mean, if you ever watch Hard Knocks, it's not the picture of health for these guys. Yeah, there is some risk there. Yeah, there's no doubt. All right. All right, give hit me with your last bust pick, and then we'll uh, oh. get out of here. All right. Well, you put me on the spot. All, All right. right. Do you? Do you do I'm going to go back. Uh, no, I'm going to go back to a name. It's less busty now. Actually, I'm going to. You know what? I'm going to go a little bit higher up, and this is going to be a shocker. I was going to say Aaron Jones, but the reality is Aaron Jones. Since my rant, and I don't know if a lot of people saw the rant, but since my rant where he was going ahead of Drake and he was going ahead of Sanders and Chubb and all those guys, don't worry, I'll, I'll, ed down. I'll edit it in right there when I when I put this out. Yeah, yeah, you know he is now dropped down. So I'm going to give you a surprising name. This is a guy I own in Dynasty leagues. I have an intimate familiarity with this person, and it's going to be a little bit surprising. But it's someone that I'm avoiding this season, and that's Dalvin Cook. And here's my reasoning why. I believe he's going way too high for the way that the Vikings are going to use him. And now I'm throwing out I'm throwing out the window the holdout threat. That is a threat. It's something to pay attention to. You're not you're not even acknowledging that in your bust evaluation. That is that's not that's a part of this. That's the cherry on top. That is the cherry. Now here's what my concern is with Dalvin Cook. He is a volume-based running back. He does it all. He's very talented. But the Vikings have learned with this guy that if you pile too much work onto him, he does break down. He's broken down every single season that he's been a part of uh, on the team so far. He's never made it through. Um, last season, he had a spectacular run. He was getting 25 touches a game, and he was getting Christian McCaffrey-like volume. Running back position is all about volume. Alexander Madison, another year in. I believe we are not going to see the volume machine version of Dalvin Cook this year that, that we saw early part of last season that got him all the hype. So what does that mean for our context? We are taking him. He's going off the board. Um, RB5 overall. Okay? Ahead of and actual... Time out, time out, time out. In our ADP, yes, he is RB5, but... If you go up to the last week, there's been a lot of um, he's trending down. Like he's going like pick like 10, 11. Now, well, now, again, that probably up, doesn't change. Your, it doesn't change your mind. I'm sure I'm it gonna, doesn't. I'm going to change it to the last week. I still see him RB5. I, and I'm going then you're right. 30 through 709. I was I was anecdotally guessing here. I'm going to go. I'm going to go 7-1. I'm going to put it home. Let's do this the right way. 7-1 to 7-9. So that's literally the last week. Yep. No, you're absolutely right. He's going as okay. RB5. So, so I, because I want to be accurate, right? Because right. these, but, these, we say well, these just, things and then they do change. Like, all right. Know, let, like, let's say, okay. us, but they just like the crowd for, catches up to. Forget RB5. Forget RB5 for a second. Let's talk about like all positions and drafts. Oh, no, he's. Where, uh, that where could would be you, true. Where yeah, would you, would where would you take him in drafts? That's really what the people want to know. Well, he's already for me. He's outside of the the top tier. So you know, I, I don't like drafting where I'm forced to make a decision like this, like Devonte Adams, or I hate drafting. You know, six, seven, eight. But I'm just telling you, even as an RB, when you're asking me where I'm going to take him, I am taking Kenyon Drake ahead of him. I don't want. I'm not gonna. So the issue is then. I'm not, I don't want to take Kenyon Drake pick five overall or pick, you know, obviously Michael Thomas goes first. Uh, usually Devontae Adams goes. And then, then we start to get to these decision points, right? He's normally going eighth, eighth overall. Let me look at the overall ADP, but l let me, the, the more important point is I don't think that Dalvin cook will deliver RB five numbers this season. 
I think that you're going to see less volume from him than we saw last year. We're going to see a healthy dose of Alexander Madison. We're going to see a healthy dose of there's other backups on that team at the running back position. I can't remember the name, but that came in when cook went out and he's a higher injury risk than your average player. So there's all of these reasons why I have these concerns about Dalvin cook. I don't want to take him at the top half of the first round and I'd rather wait I'd rather take Michael Thomas there. I'd rather take some of these other guys that are going to go. Let me look at all positions. Hang on. Let me just get my full ADP out here. Even when I look at full ADP, says. Oh, no. I'm still looking. Here you go. This, this is what it comes yeah, down yeah. to. People are going to have to make, people no, gonna have have to make a decision. Cook, when, you full, when you go full blast ADP, Dalvin Cook is going number six overall. Right. The but only it, wide receiver being taken ahead of him is Michael Thomas, to be clear. Right, but it, when, it, most of our listeners are going to be in drafts that are that are mostly sharp players, right? I mean, no, there's going to be there's a you few there's a few beginners, but I'm just going to talk. And but they're going to be the sharp players in the drafts because they're listening to us, right? That's what I would expect. Uh, that's a joke for you. That's those not even a joke. Them. No, that's yeah. real. All right, but so where is the decision point? Let's say you're picking at pick ten, and he's falling and falling and falling. Okay. Let's say that you're in a sharp draft. Drake, yeah, I'm taking him pick ten. Yeah, that's fine. You are. You, how about Eckler? Are you taking Eckler or Dalvin Cook? I'm probably taking Cook over Eckler, but that's okay. just my personal preference. But like, that's about that's about it. So you're talking about again. I'll jump back to the RB position because really, it's like, hey, who would you? Derrick Henry? Yeah. Joe Mixon? Yeah. How about Miles Sanders? Miles Sanders is squarely in the first round. I mean, yeah. I, I don't. I love Miles Sanders. I know you do too. But he's. I'm not taking him in the first round. There is. There is more. There is. Uh, in the first round, we don't. We're trying to eliminate risk, and then what we do is we take on more risk as the draft goes down. By round four, it's a little more. We want a little more riskier pick with some upside. Do we think and then Sanders round is six, risky? I for a first round pick, I do. For a second round pick, okay. no. I think that. You know, it, he ha you want guys with proven track records, high floor, high ceiling in round one. That's what we're I, looking for in round one. I, I think what's wild is that we were doing, we did, we did a podcast on this topic in May, you know, in April, where you had all of these guys, the Miles Sanders and, and the, uh, the Drakes and going super, Josh Jacobs was ahead of everybody going super late in the second round. And we're like, these guys are way undervalued. I'm yeah. grabbing them. I'm grabbing them at the end of the first. And it was like the bold call. Now, now it's a, like a vanilla line take. ADP. Now it's a vanilla take. Yeah. Like what? Go back and watch this from three months ago. We were talking about this. So it's really interesting how, how a little bit of time passes and how the takes really, really change. But um, what do you think of the Dalvin Cook call, man? Are you taking him RB5? Are you just, you know, no, right I'm after Mike you. Thomas, you taking him? I'm with you again because, um, it, it, not only is there the holdout threat, which is real, which is real, uh, you know, Dalvin Cook is is one of his guys that's like injury risks. Normally, I, I, I they don't scare me as much, and you know, I don't believe in like injury prone. I mean, and there are things, but I'm you know, it's it's dicey. Like there's certain guys that just get hurt every year, and that's it. Dalvin Cook, he had this play last year. Remember, he was out towards the end of last year with a shoulder, and he did one of those things. And and I, you know, I'm borrowing this from again. I'm borrowing this from Chris List. He was he was he made such a a brilliant comparison where he was talking about Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon when he pops the shoulder back in. He said Dalvin Cook did one of those things on the sideline where he pops his shoulder back in, like uh, almost like he didn't even need help doing it. Like it has happened three times before. Like he knew how to do it himself. Do you remember in Mel Gibson doing that? Yes, I totally remember he goes, that. He, goes, he, goes, he makes that crazy noise. He yeah, goes yeah, in. Yeah. Like you don't want a player whose shoulders popping out like that in the first round. So I'm with you. Like on the, on the one, two turn, you want to take them uh, as the 13th player. No problem. It's just, I, I don't want, I'd rather just wait and take Alexander Madison. And, and if cook goes out, Alexander Madison, who you got like, you know, RB 38 or 42 becomes a stud to lead your team to championship glory. Like that's how you win. Yeah, I'm with you on Madison. And, you know, the, every week last year in the DFS Army waiver wire podcast, I was saying, get Alexander Madison. Don't drop him. I was, you know, I'm, there's no bigger fans than us. But I, I, Mario Puig on Twitter, uh, who's a really good follow, he's he's um uh, he brought up something that was interesting, and I, I just wanted you know it's funny I have it on my list here to talk to you. Do you think that let's say Dalvin Cook is holds out or gets injured, that it's a 
that it's Alexander Madison's backfield, or do you think that Mike Boone and Alexander Madison are in an actual real timeshare and that neither one of them can be projected as a top 10 fantasy back? Do you, do you think there's anything to that? Because Mike Boone disappointed people in week 16 and then was a stud in week 17, so we've seen him flash um, you know, fantasy upside. I think Boone is going to be there and he's going to be doing his thing also, but I think he'll be initially the backup to Madison. And, and I think Madison in that situation will get the, the bulk of the carries and, and, you know, the team isn't afraid with Madison or he hasn't shown that he's some injury prone guy. We know that they're nervous about cook. We know that cook gets hurt every single year. This is why we also know that cook probably has almost no leverage in this bullshit holdout concept. No one is, is out there, you know, breaking down the door like, hey, we want we want to trade for uh, for Dalvin Cook. Like there's no team that is saying that because everybody sees the same thing. Yeah, he looks really good when he's out there, especially when he's given volume. I think all running backs or most unless they're like on Miami 10 or, or on the Jets or something tend to look good when they're given a lot of volume. I mean, yeah. look at fucking um, Leonard Fournette last year. And actually, you know what? I want to bring up Leonard Fournette. OK, let, let me I, I'm actually the. You're a Jacksonville Jaguar specialist. I am. You are living within bicycle distance of the Jaguars' uh, home stadium. I often go down there and peek my eye through the fence and watch their practice. Well, Can not this watch year. Practice, but watch a lot. There's a reason why we knew about DJ Shark last year. Absolutely. Before everybody else did. And that's because my man was watching the practices like this guy's a fucking beast, dude. You I said this looks like I said this guy looks like Randy Moss at practice. Like I just couldn't believe it. This was a thing from last year. There's a reason we were on that shit. So you are the Jacksonville specialist. I would like to ask you a full take since we have a couple minutes left mm -hmm. on right. a guy who is on a lot of people's bus list. Yeah. He didn't so make I, the list here. He did not make my list. You want to know why? I'm drafting that motherfucker, but he's on a lot of people. I don't want Leonard Fournette. Didn't do that much last year. Got a lot of pass receptions. Tell me what your scouting report is slash breakdown for a guy who is a big time everybody else's bust list guy, and that's Leonard Fournette. Yeah, it's funny. I just wrote Leonard Fournette up uh, recently. So uh, there's it, it's so interesting with Leonard Fournette that literally the market is split on him 50-50. And his ADP reflects that. Some people won't draft him at all. Other people are reaching up into the second round for him. So he settled in. His ADP says the third round, but he's actual. He's either getting drafted in the second or fourth round. He's not getting drafted at ADP oh, anywhere. RB16. <clears throat> okay, I so think, here, by the way, Melvin Gordon is the guy who's should be taken ahead of him. He's already yeah. 18. But so that he, said, here's the situation. So the Jaguars did everything. They gave every signal this offseason, going back to the spring, that they don't want Leonard Fournette on the team. They try to trade him, no takers. They didn't sign his fifth year option. They're he's not going to be on the on the Jaguars next year. Okay. There, there's been some past issues with him. Supposedly he's corrected him. So go back to the 2019 season geek. He had a very low touchdown total, three touchdowns. That is Could not, not gonna, yep, that is not gonna do it for fantasy. But his fantasy production was offset for the positive because he got a hundred targets, a hundred targets, 76 receptions, receptions. So, which is borderline. Even though there weren't many yards attached to it, it's borderline like a pretty good wide receiver. Yeah. So, okay. So that now we're back into 2020 new offensive coordinator, Jay Gruden, John Gruden's brother, who was the head coach at Washington is brought in. What's the first thing that he did was he recruited Chris Tom, from his days at Washington to come in. What do we know? We know that in the past, Jay Gruden has deployed Chris Thompson as a prolific pass catcher. I mean, there's games where Chris Thompson had eight for 80, 10 for one for 100 yards. Chris, we know that Chris Thompson is going to be a pro, uh, is going to be a significant part of the passing game. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to get all the passing game work. And we know Chris Thompson often gets hurt, but there's probably a very low chance that Leonard Fournette gets 100 targets again. I would say that his catch totals won't be close to 76, but in my projections, I have Leonard Fournette at 48 catches. So that severely limits his upside if he doesn't get in the end zone. Now, Leonard Fournette certainly is going to be the short yardage back, and they're probably in a run them to the wheels fall off situation with Leonard Fournette. So I could see both sides. I think his ADP is fair. Okay. That's, I mean, that's good to know. It's, it's really, really hard to see a, the jump he took from 2018, 22 receptions 
to 2019, 76 receptions. Like, it's actual madness. That jump is insanity. So it's just unclear can he keep doing that. And I guess that's why he he is where he is. But, yeah, I mean, part of the reason, again, he's not on the list, I, I, would, I would actually probably still – He's Takes one of the guys we're going after him ahead of there, him. There's a couple running backs in dynasty startups that have stink on them. That you know, there's like the stinky cheese um, yeah. running backs, oh, and he's James one of them. Connor, <laughs> James Connors. Right, you got it. There's there's a yeah. tier of running backs that that for some Melvin reason. Gordon. I yeah, like well, this Mel, although Melvin Gordon's moving up, you know, people are, are are buying back in. But yeah, it's Todd Gurley, it's Melvin, it's sorry, it's Todd Gurley, it's Leonard Fournette, it's David Montgomery, though it's Devin Singletary. Those are the guys that you couldn't buy last year that are fully available for a first round pick. If, if you offer a team a first, a 2021 first you're talking you're, dynasty. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying, but that translates to redraft. That's why these guys, if they weren't the stinky cheese uh, running backs, they'd be going in the round one and two, all the smelly, you know, the stinky running backs get pushed down to round three and four. And then David Johnson belongs in that, in that too, which we are completely out on. And that was the thing I was going to tell you. So quickly before you wrap it up, what, who is your one irrational bust? And what I mean by that is the, the player that you're just not getting on any team. You don't even have a good reason for it. Or you may, you may, but without explanation, who's just one player that you have just cannot click draft on. You don't even think the price is fair. You don't think it's good. You don't think it's bad. Who's the irrational bust that you just are not taking in 2020? I'm, I'm going, this is a pretty high pick. So again, a little controversial, but I don't have any shares of Julio Jones. You're not taking him in, in late in round two. No, I mean, if he's there, I, I just That's I never he's going wind up with, I'm always I'm always interested in someone else. I'm always interested in a running back there. I'm always he just never winds up on my team. I don't have a good reason for it. I think Julio Jones is fine. I do think he gets injured. He didn't get injured last year, but he's he's the kind of player we've seen a lot of that injury history with him. I just don't have him on my teams, and I just think he tends to to go. Like he's going ahead of DeAndre Hopkins. Whenever Julio Jones is available, let's say it's late second. If I have a late second pick, I'm I'm kind of like, well, there's so many good wide receivers still left on the board. Let me grab another running back here. So it's just the way of where he yeah. goes right. that I so, never wind up with him on a team. And so I probably just, never will. It's funny you say that because like Julio Jones get and and I understand it because and that's what this segment is. This segment is who's uh, your you said irra irrational. irrational. I don't want to have to rationalize. If I have to rationalize that, I wasn't going right, to say it because, because I don't want people being like, oh, I shouldn't take Julio Jones. Right. Because listen to the game. My team. Listen to the game. Like, and I agree with you. He has that perception that he misses games. But here's the here's the game. The games played over the last four years. 15 games, 16 games, 16 games, 14 games, 16 games. So he's only missed two games in the last so five questionable. years. <laughs> coming in and out of yeah, games. No, no. he every time he gets tackled it's like oh is he getting up no i, yeah. I get it and uh it, it's an irrational thing for mine it's a little bit deeper down the draft but there's i am out on christian kirk in every shape way and form and that fact that he had one three touchdown game last year people got excited and said ah oh, see he's great i don't know this this uh clip kingsbury this regime did not draft him i know he's projects as a decent player i just i never draft him i never liked him as a player there was something about his film that didn't i didn't like and i could be proven wrong he could be a great player but with deandre hopkins in town with larry fitzgerald still there and in, in siphoning tar, i just don't see that how that christian kirk is going to be predictably uh good for fantasy you went way down the list like i'm i'm taking <laughs> fucking i'm taking wr4 you're coming in with wr40 Come on, make a bold call. You know, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, well, that's Chris a player. Godwin. I mean, that'll that, be a bold. Right. But that's a player that a lot of people draft that the, he has his hive of fans. And I just wanted to bite back at that. And yeah. again, it's a lot. There's a lot. He was last year. He was going as a fifth round pick. I was like, fifth. This I'm, guy should be a double digit round pick. So let me that was, let me throw a quick name. Let me throw a quick name. And then we got to wrap. You. And we got to wrap. Yeah, before we wrap, Julian Edelman is another guy. 34 overall. Cam Newton, possible quarterback. Can't deliver the football. He's with not accuracy. going to. Just to be clear, he's going 34th wide WR34. receiver. WR34. Right, you said overall. That's why I want to make sure. WR34 overall, right? Not, not. Well, it's not, a, not overall. Yeah, right. w, going, yeah, going WR34. If Cam Newton is the quarterback, he will not deliver the football to Julian Edelman. No chance. A tiny guy, they had to draft giants for him and his fucking overthrows. Okay, so I'm sorry, Julian Edelman. I love you. One of my favorite players of all time. Not this year. Not my team. All right. 
That'll wrap it up. Yeah. For the bowl call, DFS Army, busts, fantasy bust show. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the smash the like button. Smash the subscribe button. We need hit the alert button so you know when we go live. Yeah, and comment on the video in YouTube, and we'll definitely comment back. Like we love interaction. Hit us up on Twitter. Follow F Football Geek. Geek loves talking to the people. For me, just follow my name, Alan Seslowski. It's in the the comments over here. Follow me on Twitter. Um, I love interacting. If you ever need start sits answered, we do that. I'm happy to interact and uh, join us over at DFS Army. And if you're on Instagram, if you love Instagram, Alan Fantasy Football, uh, we're posting exclusive content that I only put on uh, that platform. Naked, and if you're a TikToker, naked. if you like TikTok, I'm on there too, Alan Seslowski. And Follow our DFS Army account. We put out tons of good, actionable information, not just on football, on all sports. Baseball starting up, Geek. Um, and uh, uh, basketball starting up. Uh, our guys over at Sportsbet Army are, are fine-tuning their models. We, we've started seeing uh, an influx of membership again over at Sportsbet Army. So a lot going on. I'm excited to get sports started again. Uh, I can't wait. A couple weeks away. MLB opening pitch. NBA doing their crazy round robin tournament thingy, however they're doing the tournament playoffs. So much going on. Go to dfsarmy.com, sign up as a VIP. You can use promo code SAYS to get 20% off. Says one thing I'm going to mention about DFS Army before we go. As of today, you can still get VIP, which includes every single sport that we cover for fantasy purposes for um, $49.99. And then we have the promo code 20% off. That gets you to $39.99. Love it. Within a couple of weeks, the pricing structure is changing. We're, we, we offer way too many sports. We're separating some of them. So if you're core four type people, you like football, basketball, nothing's going to change. We're going to have a special sub for that. Uh, but if you're a real true DFS enthusiast and you want to participate in tennis and soccer and MMA and esports and NASCAR and PGA and all those side sports, um, <coughs> I advise sign up now. Because within a few weeks, we're, you know, we're, we always take care of our current members, our loyal followers. But, you know, going forward, our coverage has been so good. I mean, this weekend in NASCAR, it, it, did you see what happened Sunday? Three DFS Army members all tie for first place on FanDuel, each one 29K. I mean, that shit isn't even unusual. It happens every single week because our tools are superior to everybody else's. All these new sites opening up and all these newfangled um uh, bullshit uh, people coming in and they're they're hired guns and these pros that are showing their wins but not using the tools that they're selling that's not how we operate we use our tools we use our optimizer we use our projections and our members are winning every single week with this stuff um it is undeniable you don't have you don't place three members in first place in a 40,000 uh entrant contest by accident that's how we roll and it happens every single week so Get to DFSArmy.com now. Sign up as a VIP before some of these other start, sports start up and before we have to jack up the prices because, shit, it quite honestly, it's just a lot to cover. <laughs> Seven, you know, we added six new sports during the Rona and we're going to keep covering them as well as we do. So, all right. Very that's good. The industry is going, man. Good luck. Right. With, uh, and, and of course, any membership as part of C um, DFS Army, no matter which one, gets you access to the draft kit. So you want our draft kit, get signed up as DFSArmy.com VIP. Again, for the Bowl Call podcast, my name is Kevin Allen. I'm here with Season Long Says, Alan Sislowski. Until next time, crush those drafts, guys. Got the best coaches in the game. <laughs> we really ain't playing. We regroup up in the Slack chat where the coaches debrief. We be piecing these puzzles, occupy the chunk of the pie. Ain't no lie when we hit the block. Helmets casket is top. You be seeing helmet after helmet, helmet after helmet. First place, second place, fifth place, eighth place, twelfth place, fifteen, sixteen, twenty. So many helmets, you got blur vision, we got.